Today, we're going to talk about health wearables and student privacy. The, uh, my primary areas of practice are <clears throat> special education and student work. So I sort of come at this with a different lens, maybe than um, E matters people or IT people in a school district. And a lot of what my lens is about is thinking about accessibility and privacy, uh, discipline. We have a lot of social media issues in the student realm. Um, and so I'm sort of thinking about it in a slightly different way. And so a lot of what we're going to talk about today is sort of putting that lens on the use of health wearables. Uh, health wearables from my research in this are developing really rapidly. And they seem to have a level of portability that is greater than a lot of other technologies that are used in school. So unlike a Chromebook that's hooked up to a district server that has filters and controls that are used through the school district, uh, a lot of the health wearables are much more portable and push information or receive information through Wi-Fi. Um, so a little bit different. And so far, um, it's not entirely clear whether there's an understanding of where that information that's pushed to an app or that the app is pushing to the user, uh, where that's going besides just between the device and the student. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit too. I think in this case, the technology is probably developing faster than the law and policy can keep up. And so a lot of what I'd like to talk about today is sort of thinking about uh, putting those two things together. So the technology is there, and what do you want to think about when you're developing uh, policies to keep up with what those are? Uh, and then also to talk about existing law as it applies to health wearables and the information that they generate. Um, so we'll talk about a couple specific federal laws, what health wearables are, and that's sort of not specifically, but a little more of a theoretical discussion as well. Um, current and future uses of health wearables, where the information goes, and then some thoughts about considerations uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. So before we get into specifics about health wearables and student privacy, I think it's, it's useful to think about various laws that might apply to the information that's generated when you're using a health wearable. There are several overarching federal laws, and we're going to focus on two, FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, and HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. I also just want to note that there is a lot of variability across states related to the privacy of student data that's transmitted online or through apps or through Wi-Fi, through hardware. Um, in California, about four years ago, Governor Brown signed three pieces of legislation uh, into action to enhance protection for student data online. Uh, that covered contracting requirements, social media, privacy laws, um, and operators of online K-12 services and applications. So similar to COPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So in California, the protections for students are greater than federal law and probably a lot different than they might be in other states. So it's important to understand your state landscape as well. And then in addition, local school districts could have policies that come into play as well related to parent notification. So what are parents notified about in terms of use of technology and where that information goes? Uh, when those happen, when the notices are required to go out. Um, consent, so things like is consent an opt-in or an opt-out situation? Um, and that can add a further layer uh, to student privacy and the information that's collected and stored related to health apps. So I would really encourage you to sort of look at these three levels to determine uh, exactly what applies to you and to your school district. Okay, next slide. 
So what we're going to look at first are federal guidelines related to FERPA, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, and HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, as they relate specifically to student records. And this is going to provide us with some key ideas as we talk about uh, student privacy and health wearables. And um, at the end, I'm going to probably talk until about 1040, and then we should have time for some questions um, that Jasmine will forward to me through the chat. Um, the federal joint guidance on FERPA and HIPAA was just updated in December 2019. So this guidance has come out very recently. It was the first time it had been updated in 2008. Uh, that was 11 years ago. And I'm sure that you understand there have been many, many technological advances over that period of time, the types of devices that are available at a much lower cost and much wider um, have changed a lot. So the guidance at this point is catching up uh, to where we are in terms of technology. Okay, uh, next slide. So we'll talk first about FERPA. And FERPA protects the privacy of a student's education records. And that's in quote. Uh, because I, it seems like a pretty straightforward idea, but the definition of education records is debated a lot more than you might think. And that's because once the student information becomes an education record, all of the confidentiality of that record has to be protected and it can only be disclosed under certain circumstances. So uh, things like uh, we deal with on a daily basis Email, for example, um, we argue a lot that unless an email is printed and put into a student's file, it doesn't meet the definition of an education record. It's more like an informal conversation between people. Um, there's discussions about whether only hard copies of things are education records. So uh, it becomes important because the right to access the record, how the record is maintained, when the record can be disclosed, how confidential the record is, uh, that all comes into play once that record actually meets this definition under FERPA. And that definition is that the record has to be directly related to a student. So it contains personally identifiable information about that student. Um, it doesn't have to only be about that student. So you could, for example, have uh, logs of services that are provided that have a list of students, but the, re the entry in that log related to one student could make it an education record for that student. Uh, and then the second part of the definition, and these both have to be met, is that the record has to be maintained by an educational agency or a party acting for that educational agency. And I think this becomes something to really think about in terms of the data that is collected or pushed by health apps. Is that maintained by the school district or is it maintained by a software company or a tech company that is uh, getting information from students and keeping it somewhere? If it has individualized information in it, it could be a student record being maintained by a third party and FERPA would apply. Uh, if it's being maintained in any format by a school district, uh, it could bring that information under the definition of an education record. Uh, so that's an important thing to think about. It seems pretty straightforward, but the two main concepts are personally identifiable information and whether it's maintained. And those are two important things when we talk about the data that's collected by health wearables. A student's health records, and that includes immunization records, it's the most common, that are maintained by a, a school district and uh, would generally constitute education records that are not subject um, to HIPAA, and we'll talk about that next. So um, health records aren't necessarily um, covered by HIPAA. They may, however, be covered by FERPA. So there's a little bit of a distinction. We're gonna talk about HIPAA and, and how that's different. Okay, next slide. Here we are with HIPAA. So Congress enacted HIPAA in 1996, partly because of an increase in 
transmission of electronic health information, and they wanted to improve, Congress wanted to improve the efficiency uh, by creating some kind of national standard um, and requirements for electronic transmission of health information. Um, the acronym that's used for this information is PHI, or Protected Health Information. Uh, HIPAA applies only to, quote, covered entities, uh, which, and this is very important, are providers of health and medical services that transmit health information in electronic format in connection with covered transactions. And covered transactions is just, are just transactions that have some sort of regulation uh, that's been adopted by the Federal Department of Health and Human Services. And mostly what they're talking about uh, are submitting healthcare claims to a health plan. So there's a few sort of nuggets in here in this definition. First, you have to be a provider of health or medical services. You have to be transmitting the health information in electronic format and it has to be related to a covered transaction. So um, something for billing, for example. And then you would also be covered uh, by HIPAA. HIPAA requires the covered entity uh, to protect an individual's health records and other personal health information. So it sort of adds another layer of potential confidentiality to um, the information that's being transmitted. Okay, next slide. So here's the intersection. Uh, they don't really sound like they would have a lot of uh, general context with both schools and health providers, but HIPAA might apply to a school. Uh, for example, if a school provides health care in the normal course of business, and I can think of several schools that I work with in the Bay Area, uh, that have on-campus medical and dental services, and uh, they have agreements with the school district and they do transmit information electronically for billing purposes, um, under those circumstances, that school could meet the definition of a healthcare provider, which means that they would have to comply with all of the HIPAA privacy rules. Um, I don't want you to get too carried away with this idea though, just because a school employs a school nurse, for example, or a school psychologist, uh, that doesn't automatically make the school a covered entity. Again, you would have to be, as the school, engaged in a covered transaction like billing a health plan electronically in order to come under HIPAA. Um, we've had a lot of questions since COVID-19 and the school closures about whether HIPAA applies to teletherapy, such as speech teletherapy, occupational teletherapy. Um, and you know, we have said in most circumstances, the answer is no. Um, it is a different way of providing that service. It's not health related and it's not being billed to a health plan. It's an educational service that's funded and provided through a school district. So, in that case, um, most of the time, it's going to just be a school-related service, not covered by HIPAA. So one other thing to note is that HIPAA, uh, the privacy rule specifically excludes FERPA education records. So if health information like immunization records are only maintained in the student's file, so they don't go anywhere. They're not transmitted electronically for billing purposes. The HIPAA privacy rule would not apply. So uh, it's possible that the data from health wearables might bring a school district under HIPAA, and we'll talk about um, things, a couple of those a little bit later. Uh, it's just important to keep it in mind because they both could apply potentially in the school context. It's pretty rare. Uh, that HIPAA would apply, but it can happen. So just something to, something to keep in mind. Okay, next slide. So as we've talked about, the vast majority of health information that's maintained in a student's education record would not be subject to HIPAA privacy rules. Uh, but there is a little bit of gray area. Uh, many health wearables collect health-related information about individual students. 
Because if you want that individual feedback from something like a Fitbit or a smartwatch, it's going to come back to an individual student. Uh, related to FERPA, if that information is stored or maintained, does that then become an education record? And that education record has to be maintained according to the policy of your local school district, how it's destroyed is usually uh, governed by that as well. So once it sort of gets into that realm, there are a whole lot of privacy and other uh, rules about what can happen with that information. And if it does become an education record, FERPA may impose some restrictions on its disclosure to third parties. Uh, so if it's being pushed automatically to, a, to the program that's being used or to an app developer or the tech company, uh, is that a disclosure that's allowable under FERPA? I think that's a question that you wanna ask. Um, and remember that we're not talking about uh, we are talking about personal health information, and especially in the area of COVID-19 during this era, um, there are some exceptions whereby information can be disclosed without consent for health and safety reasons. And so um, there could be a little bit of intersection between the information that is uh, collected through health wearables and information that might need to be disclosed due to a, a health or safety concern. And um, we'll give some specific examples of that as well. Okay, so that is basically an outline of the law. Again, you wanna be um, thinking about the three levels, the federal, the state, and the local, when you're uh, trying to decide how the information collected from health wearables is stored, maintained, used, who is it going to, um, and how is it being collected through what means. Okay, uh, next slide. So what are health wearables? I can tell you, um, I have a Fitbit. It sits in my closet all the time. Uh, I do use my phone to track a number of things. My um, doctor's office has an app that we communicate through and I can put information into um, food trackers and I do check steps now and then, but I'm probably not the best user of health wearables um, because it's not something that was part of my world. My kids, on the other hand, use it all the time. Um, they check their phones for different things and are much more dialed into this. So um, it's a new world. One of the questions I sort of had was thinking about a little more theoretical or what really are health wearables? What are they for? Um, I'm kind of using it as giving information to me. And I think the way that they're being used in schools is a little bit different. So it's really sort of a two-way interface between the user and the world. Um, it collects information automatically. So it's not asking you. As you're walking around, it is automatically collecting the information on your phone to tell, tell you how many steps you've taken uh, and how many flights of stairs you've climbed during a day. The device or the app can also analyze the information for the user and sometimes they're using specific algorithms that maybe the teacher or the student or the school district doesn't have information about. So it could be saying that it's collecting information about steps, but how is it doing that? And is it just looking at movement? Is it also looking at body temperature and heart rate? Um, when that information is collected, where is it going? If it's going to a company, is the company using it for something other than just measurement? So just questions to think about. And the devices can also provide feedback to the user. And then that feedback might be pushed to a third party. And that's all happening in real time. So it's not asking you most of the time whether you want that information to go back to you or you want that information to be pushed to the app, which then goes on to uh, some type of company. So it, it, again, is something to think about. This is happening in real time. So if you are using a health uh, wearable, it's important to understand that a lot of the, um, the devices and what is happening is, is doing, it's doing it automatically. So it's not asking you necessarily. So it's very important to understand on the front end um, what exactly is being collected, how and where is it going because you might not know in the moment, in that real-time moment, uh, how that's occurring. 
And then based on um, the feedback or the data that's collecting, the device might prompt you to do something. So it could prompt you to get up and move, take deep breaths, uh, do a mindfulness exercise. So it's prompting action by the user. So the way that they're intended to be used is really a back and forth between the user, the environment, and the device. And unlike me, who's just looking at it for information, um, anytime you're widening that circle, so you're widening it to not just the user, but a teacher, um, an app, and the environment, um, it brings up questions about student privacy and where that information is going. Okay, next slide. So the range of health wearables can also be very, very wide. Um, they're the typical things that uh, you might see in a PE class like a Fitbit or a smartwatch or a smartphone that monitors steps and nutrition. There are armbands that can track heart rate. Um, a lot of colleges uh, I'm seeing these days are trialing wristbands that monitor a student's stress level and anxiety. Um, they do this by tracking heart rate and body temperature. Um, and they're sort of getting at the student's mental state as inferred through body functions. And I find this sort of fascinating uh, and wonder how much of a connection there really is between the information coming in and the mental state. Uh, but I think that's why uh, people are so interested in the idea. Um, it also can give educators an idea of attention or anxiety related to specific types of instruction that might be going on. Uh, so you could get some feedback or some data and then potentially change how things are going in a class based on the biometric data that's coming back from a student's wristband. There's also things like uh, wearable GPS devices. AngelSense is one of them that in special ed we deal with a lot. Uh, they track a student's whereabouts and feed that information automatically to the parent most of the time. Uh, sometimes the the device can include a camera. And so we get into a lot of discussions about uh, whether or not that's allowable and whether you're filming other students, teachers instruction, um, and they might not even be aware of it. So you could turn on the camera or the audio uh, and someone could be listening to it on the other side and you might not ever know. Um, they obviously can be very helpful, especially for students who are a flight risk. Um, we see them a lot with autistic students who elope. That's one of the behaviors that they uh, display at school sometimes. And um, also now what I'm seeing with AngelSense is that the, there, there's this interactiveness again that it, we're talking about where someone can try to intervene and help a student uh, decompress or de-escalate um, through the device, uh, which is a, an interesting idea. Another one that I found very fascinating uh, were eye trackers like Google Glass that can sense when a student's attention and focus are waning. So if you're looking through your Google, Google Glass uh, and you're not really paying much attention to what's on the screen or you're looking around or whatever it is, um, that's going to give information about attention and focus. So just a couple more to uh, examples here. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, next, oh, there we go. I got it. Now I can see it. Um, brainwave headsets. I found this one extremely fascinating. They use an EEG to measure brain activity um, and they offer feedback on a brain state through an app. That app then prompts the student to do something. So it could be refocusing, calming strategies, using mindfulness, meditation, um, and they're being piloted on students with disciplinary issues. Uh, there's a school in San Francisco, a charter school that has been doing this and they have the kids, uh, specifically kids who tend to have disciplinary issues, wear the headsets. And when they start to, uh, their attention or focus starts to wane, when they start to get agitated as measured through these brain waves, uh, it will prompt the student to engage in some sort of strategy to refocus, uh, decompress, de-escalate, 
uh, at least in some small studies, it was showing that um, it was helpful in reducing disciplinary issues. I think, you, you know, there obviously is a whole lot more going on here and a lot of information that's being collected about these students. Uh, and it raises a lot of concerns about what that information is used for. Uh, and then also whether it is being used maybe disproportionately on students with disciplinary issues. So, uh, and does that bring into play some equity issues? So I found this to be really fascinating. Um, it's an interesting technology, but um, you know, in terms of collection of data and what you do with it, uh, it raises a lot of concerns for me about uh, what information is being collected, who is it being sent to, the equity of who it's being used for. So just a lot of things to think about. Uh, but that's one example sort of on one end of the spectrum. Uh, okay, next slide. So one other specific example are uh, diabetes monitoring devices. They are starting to develop wearable glucose monitors that have built-in sensors that take uh, blood sugar measurement. So it's sort of got an embedded needle that will take the measurement without even asking the user about it. Um, and then that data is collected and read by the app and then pushed to a smartphone. Again, these are sort of real time uh, situations. It, they do help because they help students not spend as much time out of class doing uh, blood sugar monitoring. Um, my question though is about, um, where this data is going. So it's probably going to a student, it's probably going to the parent, it's going possibly to the school nurse who is monitoring that student in school. It could be going to that student's physician. Um, and so one question I had was, if that's going out to all those people, is potentially that health information going to come under HIPAA privacy rules as well? If there's a little too much entanglement between um, the medical services and providers for the student and the school district. Uh, so uh, just another thought here. Um, these are great things, but um, again, uh, where the information is going and whether or not people understand where it's going to and how it's being used are really important. Okay, next slide. So again, Really, for me, one of the main concerns here, uh, we know that to some degree, the type of data and the specific health data that a health wearable can collect, but then what happens to it? Um, if it's automatically sent to an app, is that via a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth connection? So if school districts um, will really want to think about how to apply the same security measures to the transmission of data collected by health wearables as it does to other technology. Uh, and so, you know, you really want to work with your IT department to make sure that transmissions of that health information are secure. Um, and we've gotten a little taste of what can go wrong when people uh, can hack into streams of information with the recent Zoom bombing that's happened during the COVID-19 closures. Um, so think about that. Um, just because it's super portable and easy to use uh, doesn't mean that um, it shouldn't be under the same degree of, uh, of security that other district technology is. So if it's going to use Wi-Fi and you have Wi-Fi at your school district, is it going through the school district's Wi-Fi network? So similar to hard, hard hardware, where you're hooked into a system. Um, there's also concern that many of the, the data collections that happen through health wearable companies, um, they promise to anonymize and aggregate the data so they're not um, collecting it related to an individual student. Uh, but it's just to be wary that the more information that is added to that pile, the more likely it is that you could identify an individual student. So for example, if you're in a PE class and you're collecting information through a health app and a device, and that's being pushed to the teacher, and maybe it's being collected by the, the tech company as well, and you add fitness test results to that, um, does that can that somehow be then non-anonymized or disaggregated to an individual student? 
So now this third party vendor potentially has individualized student information. Um, so just be aware of that. And if it is a promise to have things anonymized or aggregated, um, that they stay that way. Uh, and that there are safeguards in place to make sure that it, you know, there's so much data is not collected uh, that it, it's, it is you're able or they're able to figure out who individual students are. Uh, and then again, understanding whether and how the data is stored by a tech company. So ensuring that it's not traceable to an individual student um, because as we talked about before, once it becomes an individual education record, it's subject to FERPA protections. And that obligation extends to contractors with school districts as well. So if you have a contract with a company that uh, helps out with health wearables uh, and you're collecting information that then becomes an individual health, uh, student record, uh, that company is going to be required to um, comply with FERPA protections as well. And then consider how the data is stored by the school district. Um, as an education record, most school districts have policies regarding the maintenance and destruction of records and then noticing uh, families about how that works. So um, if it's being stored, then there needs to be some understanding of how it's stored, where it's stored, whether it's stored as an education record, and then how it will be destroyed uh, if that's the, that's the direction that you go. Okay, uh, next slide. So we've talked about a few of these first ones already, Wi-Fi security and randomized data becoming unrandomized. We don't want that to happen. And st storage and uh, student records. So the bottom two uh, really sort of stick out to me primarily as a special education attorney. Um, and first is whether the data collected through health wearables might raise special education child find obligations. So as you may know, uh, all school districts have an obligation to locate, assess, and identify students with disabilities. So what if, for example, student data coming from a wristband monitor, so it's monitoring stress levels, comes back very elevated over a period of time, or differently than you're seeing it for other students? Or what if the brainwave headset is showing significant periods of inattention? that are sort of out of the range for the rest of the students who are doing that. Uh, my concern is that that kind of information could trigger child find obligations um, to have the school district or the school consider whether the student may need to be referred for a special education assessment. Um, you know, that occurs now with, uh, for example, general education counseling, where it's not a special education function um, and a student might go in and have a lot of um, mental health concerns. And um, we, you know, what we always want is for that school counselor to then, if there are concerns about a potential disability, uh, let the special education department know or someone know what's going on. Um, with health wearables, <clears throat> that information is potentially more automatic. So it's coming back automatically from the device. And, you know, in some ways it might be more objective, depending on how well that health well wearable is measuring things. Um, so it's another, another uh, idea to keep in mind is uh, the person or the teacher who is using the device, having the students use the device, might not be thinking about the potential special ed obligations that could come into play. So that's an area for um, training or exposure for uh, staff who might be using health wearables. When things come back and they look completely different, um, what, what should you do about that? And then this last one is just from my sort of lawyer brain. And I kind of wonder whether some of the more invasive information about a student's mental state, for example, um, could be considered a type of search. So, and this sort of analogizes for me back to the idea of urine testing for students and some of the Supreme Court cases that came out of that and whether those constituted a search. Um, so if you're getting all of this invasive health information back on students through a health wearable um, and you find out something that maybe is a violation of school rules, uh, 
would that be considered a search? And if so, was it reasonable? Um, did the student, the parent truly understand the nature of the consent if they're using the health wearable and consent was given? Um, so that's just kind of a theoretical question that came to my mind. Um, and in talking with people, it sounds like something that hasn't really been uh, raised so far, but um, it's there. It's there for me. I'm just wondering, especially considering sort of the Supreme Court cases that have come before uh, sort of along the same vein, but not using technology. Okay, uh, next slide. So before using health wearables, here's just some suggestions uh, for uh, making sure that all of the concerns are uh, thought about before they're sort of implemented. Um, they are easily accessible, as are the apps, and the price of health wearables is going down. So um, is staff aware of the potential privacy concerns before using them? Um, and so are they asking if it's okay to use the Fitbit? And do they understand where the information is going, how it's being stored, uh, whether it's somehow you know, being stored and coming under the definition of an educational record? So uh, just making sure staff is aware, is aware before they start using health wearables and what the potential concerns are. And sort of along those same lines, has the device or the website or the app been vetted through the same process that you would use for other technologies, for Zoom, for example, for iPad apps? Um, you want to think about the health wearable, even though it's very portable and very easy and usually cheap, um, has it been vetted through that same process? Do you have a process for notifying parents of the use or potential use of the health wearables? Uh, is it covered by your annual parent notifications? Is it part of your board policy? Uh, because again, we've kind of got three layers of law here, the federal, the state, and the local, and you wanna make sure that the use is complying with, um, with each of those levels. Is there a processing for safeguarding and storing the collected data? And is that covered by a current policy? And another big one, especially for me as a special education attorney, um, is the device accessible to all students? And by accessible, I mean two things. Um, first of all, do students have equal access to the device and what's needed to use the device? So for example, uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, and this is coming up in a big way uh, during the COVID-19 um, closures because there is a huge variation on how connected uh, particular students and families are and how that affects their access to distance learning. So same idea, accessibility in terms of equal access to the device and what's need to, you, needed to use the device effectively. Um, the second kind of accessibility that I just wanna to touch on is accessibility for students with disabilities. So would a student with a visual impairment be able to access the device and the process for analyzing the data. Um, if they can't, this could potentially be a discrimination issue. So you wanna make sure that if you have students with disabilities in a class using a health wearable, uh, that it's accessible to that student. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, you might wanna consider um, thinking about a specific board policy that is aimed at these health wearables and very portable devices and, and the apps that go with them. Um, and that could be helpful in sort of focusing the conversation and clarifying um, questions people may have. Okay. So the last uh, couple items here are about COVID-19. I know this is on everyone's mind. It's on my mind as I'm home with two kids in online school and a teacher who's teaching online. Um, the CDC has recently put out guidelines for school reopening. They put them out at the beginning of May and they were just updated last week. Um, again, how school openings or reopenings happen is gonna vary dramatically from state to state and district to district. Um, here in California, it's pretty much been left up to local school districts to figure that out. In the county where I live, the County Office of Education is figuring that part of it out to try to sort of keep the different schools at least um, in line in some way with each other. 
Um, what the CDC is suggesting for school reopening is procedures like um, self-reporting symptoms and positive tests or exposure to people who have tested positive as students are coming into school. So some sort of self-reporting once they get in. Um, daily health checks for students. So taking temperatures and looking at symptoms. Um, all of this is gonna be creating potentially personal health information and it may end up in a student's education record. So FERPA privacies are probably going to apply. Um, if a student self-reports symptoms or exposure, the next question is, is it permissible to notify local health officials? Uh, this is something that a lot of school districts are asking. Um, again, there is some federal guidance, but you also want to know what your state and local obligations are to report uh, health information and to keep student records confidential because there is a tension between those two things. Uh, next slide. Um, so the U.S. Department of Education issued a, an FAQs related to FERPA and COVID-19. Because uh, as we just talked about in the last slide, a lot of the, the reporting requirements or temperature taking that CDC is recommending could be creating student records. Uh, FERPA does include an exception for health and safety emergencies. Um, it provides that personally identifiable information from a student's record, including health records, can be disclosed to appropriate parties, that's a key, key part of this, in connection with a health or safety emergency without consent, um, if it's necessary to protect the health and safety of the student or under other individuals. So this is not a blanket exception. So when, if you have a student who comes in and is exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19 or has been exposed to someone who has tested positive, uh, you can't just tell everyone. So it's not a blanket exception. It has to be uh, to appropriate parties. Um, and you wanna make that determination on a case-by-case -case basis. So if it's the health department that needs to know, then it should just be the health department that you tell. Um, it might be possible to provide more information without disclosing who an individual student is. Um, and I know that uh, I've gotten these, you know, letters from school on a regular basis, especially when my kids were in elementary school about someone having been exposed to lice or whooping cough or whatever it is, uh, but not naming the student. So um, those two things just keep in mind. This exception for health and safety emergency is not a blanket exception. It should be made on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and you want to err on the side of, of protecting student confidentiality. So if there's a way to provide information about potential exposure and not uh, explain, not say, not expose who the individual child is, um, that's something to, to think about. Okay. Some final thoughts, um, using health wearables, I, I think it's always important to think about the connection of the technology to learning. What is it for? Um, and you know, a lot of times uh, technology is used for technology's sake, but really connecting it to curriculum. Um, and I think that can help in understanding what some of the privacy concerns and student privacy concerns are. Uh, because it's telling you, if you're connecting it to learning, exactly what kind of data you're looking for and why it's important. And I think that can uh, give rise to some questions about confidentiality as well. Um, transparency is key. So if you are using health wearables in a class related to curriculum um, is to let students and parents and staff understand exactly what it's for, where the information is going, how long it's going to be maintained if it is, um, and you know, not, not leaving that up to the imagination, but really thinking about it and being transparent uh, so that parents can make um, a, um, a determination about whether they want their child to be involved with that or not. And then finally, equity. Uh, while all kinds of technology, including health wearables, is getting more and more accessible, it is not accessible to everyone. Uh, in terms of the hardware and how you use it, um, and as well as accessibility for students who have disabilities like um, hearing impairments or visual impairments 
physical impairments that might make that very difficult. So when using them, think about that. Think about accessibility and accessibility for students with disabilities, because uh, those are two really big equity issues um, that come up. Okay. So thank you for listening for the last uh, 49 minutes. And if people have questions, I am happy to take a stab at answering those.